Well, today we kick off a brand new message series. We're going to be going to the Old Testament and we're going to look at one of the books there. Are, are any of you out there big time movie fans? And if that is you, what's your favorite genre? I'm curious, those who are watching online, go ahead right now, type that in the comment section, your favorite genre of movie. For me, it's action movies. Any other action fans out there? You know, you've seen all 85 Fast and Furious movies. You know, the more violence and speed, explosions, the more excitement, the better. That's where I'm at. How about comedy fans? Any huge fans of comedy out there? You just love a movie that makes you laugh. I mean, it makes you so laugh so hard your, your, your stomach hurts. You think Will Ferrell is the greatest actor to ever grace the screen. How about any superhero movie fans? Anybody out there like that? You love Marvel and you just can't wait for the next one to come out. I mean, you're planning on, in fact, you just spent your Valentine's Day at the movie theater because you had to see Captain America's Brave New World the day it came out. How about thriller fans? Any big fans of, of thriller movies? I think you people are sick. You love to be scared out of your mind. Why would you do that to yourself? I mean, fight and flight is for protection, not for entertainment. But you love that. You love that adrenaline rush that comes from spending two hours scared out of your mind. And then there's you sci-fi fans out there. I know you're there. I know you're there. And you guys are unique. Any Trekkie fans in the house? Star Wars, yeah, Star Wars is way better in my humble opinion. How about Doctor Who fans? I know you guys, you guys are, are fanatics. Am I missing any categories? Oh, oh yeah, how, how can I forget? Especially around Valentine's Day, which just happened. Any chick flick fans out there? Wave your hand if you just don't care, all right? You love some notebook or pride or prejudice. I mean, just, just thinking about Mr. Darcy makes your heart flutter. Get me my box of tissues. I need a good cry. Let's do this. Well, I've got some really good news for you chick flick fans out there. The, the book that we're going to look at, if it were a movie, that would be the genre. You're not going to find any Sylvester Stallone or Liam Nielsen or Jennifer Aniston or Drew Barrymore. There's no shootouts. There's no explosion, no car chases, no aliens, no superheroes. It's just a couple of women and a whole lot of talking. Of the 85 verses, 55 of them are dialogue. And sadly, at the core of this story is two women who have lost everything. And yet, God is present. And let me tell you what not to expect as we go through this book. Don't expect any huge miracles. There's no parting of the sea. There's no healing of the sick or raising of the dead. But on every page, we will see the presence and the power and the providence of God. This emotionally charged book I'm talking about is the book of Ruth. And it speaks specifically to those who are hurting and discouraged and losing hope, who believe that God has something better for you, but you feel stuck in a place that you know you shouldn't be. The book of Ruth. Today's message is entitled, When It's Time to Walk Away. So go ahead and grab your Bibles or your phones, open up to Ruth, and we're going to start with chapter 1, verse 1. The very beginning of the book says this. In the days when the judges ruled. We've got to stop there. In the days when the judges ruled. In other words, in the days when there were no kings. Now in the book of Ruth, if you're looking in your paper Bible, what book comes before that? It's the book known as Judges. The book of Judges. And there's this one verse in there that you see over and over again in the book of Judges. And the very last verse of the book of Judges says this. It says, in the days when the judges ruled. In other words, in the days when there were no kings. Everyone did what was right in their own eyes. 
In the days when there were no kings, in the days when the judges ruled, everybody did what was right in their own eyes. Sounds a little familiar, doesn't it? A little bit the way things are today. And I want to show you a connection. In the days when the judges ruled, there was a famine in the land. And so we're going to see a family that's going to be afraid that they're not going to be able to eat. And so they make a move. We continue with our text. So a man from Bethlehem in Judah, together with his wife and two sons, went to live for a while in the country of Moab. The man's name was Elimelech. His wife's name was Naomi. And the name of his two sons were Malin and Kilion. These were Apathrites from Bethlehem, Judah. And they went to Moab and lived there. So they're from Bethlehem, they went to Moab, and they lived there. So let's break down these characters so you know exactly who the main characters are in this plot. We have, first of all, this man named Elimelech. And he's the husband and the father, and his name means, my God is king. Then we have his wife, the the mom, her name is Naomi, and it means sweet or pleasant. So far, so good with these names, right? My God, my King, she's pleasant. Then we have the two children. And to understand how they would name their children in their time, they would generally name their children based on one of two things. Either would they name them, they would name them sort of prophetically based on what they wanted to see from their children, or they would call them based on what they saw. And in this case, it's very likely they named their children based on what they experienced when they were born. Their two names were Malin, which means sick or sickly, and Kilion, which means frail or tired. So they were probably struggling from birth. And so their names are literally sick and tired. I'd like you to meet my two sons, sick and tired. Some of you are thinking, I didn't know that was an option. Can I change the name of my kids? I mean, I'm going to call this one drama and I'm going to call that one, I don't know, uh, train wreck, something like that. (laughs) And so what we've got is a guy named my goddess king and a woman named sweet and pleasant and their children sick and tired. And Elimelech is worried about his family because there's this famine that's going across the land. And so he moves his family from Bethlehem to Moab. And I'll give you an idea of what this would look like. Bethlehem would have, uh, you'd have to, in order to get to Moab, you'd have to go around uh, the Dead Sea. And so it's about a 50 mile journey. Like from here in Hamilton, it would be the distance between here and Philadelphia or, or here and New York. And so if you were to walk three miles an hour, it'd probably take you about 16, 17 hours to make this journey. So give or take a day or two to get from Bethlehem to Moab. So he leaves Bethlehem. He takes his family to Moab, which ended up being a horrible mistake. He moves his family to Moab, a place that God had strictly forbidden his people from living. Now you might wondering, wonder, what, what's wrong with Moab? Well, the Moabites were descendants of Moab. And if you don't know who Moab is, you can read about them in Genesis chapter 19. There's a story there when Lot's daughter got their father drunk. Yes, some weird stuff happened in the Bible. And they slept with him and conceived a son. That son's name was Moab. So the Moabites were conceived out of incense, and that was probably the the beginning of their issues. They also worshipped a false god named uh, Kamash, and honestly, they would sacrifice children to this false god. And if you wonder what the God of Israel thought about Moab, Moab, we see it in Psalm chapter 60, verse 8. It says, Moab is my wash basin. In other words, this is the place where I wash my dirty feet. So Elimelech took his family from Bethlehem, which means house of bread. Any bread fans out there, right? House of bread. He takes them to this place of Moab, this wash basin, this place that God had forbidden his people to live. So when you're thinking about it, it's really interesting. Elimelech, which means my God is king, wasn't living like God was his king. Instead, he was doing what was right in his own eyes, just like so many people do today. 
Now, I don't want to be overly hard on him because there was a famine. And so he's probably thinking, if I go up to Moab, then, then there's going to be a better economy and I can get a better job and I can provide a better life for my family. I mean, you can understand, but I would just issue a gentle spiritual warning that's for, maybe for some of you here today. I've noticed when it comes to our families, we're often tempted to prioritize economic provision over spiritual protection. In other words, if someone has a job offer somewhere else and the job offers for more money, most people would just assume that must be the place to go. And oftentimes it is. Sometimes it's the blessing of God to go and have a better provision for your family. And so you could be more generous, but sometimes That's not the case. I've seen many times people that are thriving spiritually. They're getting closer and closer to God. They're plugged into Christian community. They've got an awesome church and and they go somewhere for a little bit more money and, and they get somewhere else and they have more money but less God. And so here's my warning. Be careful not to always prioritize economics over the presence of God. So things are a little tough in Bethlehem, and so Moab, I'm sorry, so Elimelech, he leaves and goes to Moab, and and they're there in that sinful place because times were difficult in Bethlehem. So what do we do? What do you do when times get tough? I mean, that's the situation he finds himself in. Do you continue to trust and obey God in Bethlehem? Or do you leave, take the situation into your own hands and go to Moab? What do you do when times get tough in your life? Because most of us would say, yes, I'm a Christian. Or or we'd say, yes, God is the king of my life. And and so I want to trust and obey his word. But maybe you're in a situation, you're like, you're like well, I, I'm dating this person, and yeah, it's true, his word says that, that we're not supposed to have sex until we're married, but, but, but you know, even though it says that, like, God, I, I don't know. I, I'm, I'm, I, I think I just, I just want to do this. I mean, we really love each other. We're really committed to each other. I, I've got my needs. And so here's the question for you. Do you trust and obey God, or do you move to Moab? My God is is king of my life and and therefore I'm going to honor him with my finances and I'm going to return to him 10% of what he blesses me with in the form of a tithe. It's not mine, it belongs to God, he's my king. But then the money gets tight and and the thing goes on sale and you really want to buy it, you need it. Do you trust and obey God or do you move to Moab? My God is, is king. He's the king of my life. I'm a Christian. And so I'm, I'm going to stop getting drunk. And I do that. I stop getting drunk. And then, then I have a really bad day. And I'm really stressed out. So do you trust and obey God? Or do you move to Moab? Because I'll shoot straight with you. And it's true for me as well. When times get tough, Moab looks tempting. And listen to me. I'm not judging you. I understand the dilemma. I really do. I understand the dilemma that this guy finds himself in. He's genuinely worried about his family. And so what does he do? He tries to figure it out on his own. He does what's right in his own eyes. Instead of being obedient to God, he does what he thinks with best. And honestly, most of us have gone to Moab under far less pressure. My God is king of my life, but sometimes we do what's right in our own eyes. So what happened? They left Bethlehem, they went to Moab, and everything worked out perfect. They did what they wanted, they did what they felt was right, they trusted their heart, they lived in their own truth, and everything happened, you know, just as they wish it would. Not quite. We read in Ruth chapter 1 verse 3, now Elimelech. Naomi's husband died and she was left with her two sons. And they married not women that worshiped the God of Israel, but they married Moabite women, one named Orpah and the other Ruth. And after they had lived there for about 10 minutes, okay, nope, that's not what it says. After they had lived there about 10 years, both sick and tired, all right, the two sons, they also died. 
in Naomi who left Bethlehem so that they would live left without her two sons and her husband. I mean, this is heartbreak. This is devastation. First, she loses her husband. We don't know what happened. Maybe he got sick. Maybe he had a stroke. Maybe he had a heart attack. Maybe it was cancer. Maybe he got ran over by a camel. We don't know. But what we do know is that he has left her in a really difficult, a really bad place. Now, it's fascinating because think about this. I mentioned earlier how far apart Bethlehem is from from Moab. It's only about 50 miles. About a day or two walk. And so even if you're taking your time, you know, you stop off at the Waffle House on your way and maybe get a Motel 6 for for one night. It's it's only going to take you two days to get from Moab back to Bethlehem. It's not that long of a walk. And yet she stays in that God-forbidden, God-forsaken place for 10 years. And she's living there and she's away from God's people. And so her sons married women that were not part of God's people. They married Moabite women. And now I want to give these guys, these these boys, the benefit of the doubt. Because the girls were probably really cute. And they were probably really nice. They probably had really good personalities. They probably thought, we can convert them. And I know that's what some of you are thinking right now. You're thinking, man, they're really cute. She's really sweet. Oh, they have such a good personality. And he's got a job. The last one I was dating didn't even have a job. He has his own place. He's not living in his parents' basement. It's the first guy that I found that has his own apartment. And you're thinking, I'll just convert them. And yet in God's love for us, he actually gives us very loving boundaries. And so many people ask, hey, Ron, is it okay if I'm a Christian and I marry someone that's not a Christian? And the answer is, not my advice, but what the scripture has to say is that that's not okay. The Bible says in the New Testament, in 2 Corinthians chapter uh, 6, it says there, that we're not to be unequally yoked with those who are unbelievers. And admittedly, that limits your playing field. So why is it that God's being so restrictive? Is he looking to spoil your fun? Is he looking to to limit your options? It's not that. He's actually loving you. And I would ask you this, sincerely. If God is the king of your life, why would you want to spend your life and raise your kids with someone who doesn't see him As their king. Now here's what's interesting. Why did they leave Bethlehem? They left so they wouldn't die. What happens in Moab? All three of the men actually die. And this is how the chick flick begins. Because you now you have three widows. With no homes. No money. No hope. Finally, things get so desperate that Naomi makes the decision to return to Bethlehem. And you can read about this in the text. Along the way, they have this conversation. Why? Because it's a chick flick. And that's what happens in a chick flick. And they have this conversation and Naomi tells her daughters-in-law, listen, girls, go back home. Marry your own people. Have babies. And and Orpah hears her say that and says, okay, I'm going back. But Ruth, Ruth decides to say. And she speaks for the first time in the story. We see it in verse 16. And here's what she says. She says, don't urge me, Naomi, to leave you or turn back from you. And here's the big wedding cake verse, all right? You've seen this, you've heard this. Where you go, I will go. And where you stay, I will stay. What's she doing here? She's declaring this fierce loyalty and love for her mother-in-law. Then in the most important part of the verse is, is not just a loyalty to a person, but she makes a declaration of dependence on God. She says this, and your people will be my people and your God will be my God. I'm no longer gonna worship Chemosh. 
Now I'm going to worship the God of Israel. And she makes this proclamation, this dedication that this is her salvation. What did she do? What, what happened? Ruth and Naomi, they actually did this. They left Moab and they returned to Bethlehem. And this really is for us a picture of what the Bible refers to as repentance. This is an act of repentance for them to leave Moab and to go to Bethlehem. Repentance. Re, it means to turn. Pent, it means the highest. So it's to return from the lower place of Moab to the higher calling of Bethlehem. It's to turn away from where you were and to go back to where God always wanted you in the first place. Now what's interesting is in order to turn to Bethlehem, you have to turn your back on Moab. To go where God wants you to be, you have to leave where you are, which highlights one of the most important truths, and that is this. To get to the right place, you have to be willing to leave the wrong one. To get to where God wants you to be, you have to walk away from a place that's not his will. I could say it this way. If you're dating someone who's not honoring you or not honoring God, then, then to marry, in, in order to marry the right person, you got to dump the wrong one. To get to the right place, you have to leave the wrong one. And what's amazing is that she made one decision to turn her back on Moab and to go to the God of Bethlehem. And this one decision, this one act of repentance is the one choice that changed her life and her legacy. And it even changed the course of the entire world. It did. Because have you ever heard of Bethlehem before? Of course you have. What does Bethlehem mean? It means the house of bread. The house of bread. Jesus is the bread of life. Jesus was born in Bethlehem. And I don't want to give away the biggest part of the book. But I just can't not tell you that Jesus was a descendant of a sinful Moabite woman who left Moab and went to Bethlehem. And this is how amazing God is, that through a woman who worshiped a false God, we're going to see in the upcoming chapters, and I don't want to give it all away because this is an incredible story. It's a chick flick I like. And we're going to see that through this decision, the living water, the bread of life, the prince of peace, the good shepherd, the Lord of lords, and the king of kings, the alpha and omega is born. One moment of repentance, one single decision changed everything. So what does this mean for you? I'm going to ask you, and I want you to be very, very open to what the Holy Spirit might show you. I wonder if there's some part of your life where you're still living in Moab. Is there some part of your life where you're just stuck there in Moab? Is there some area of your life where you're saying, God is my king, and yet you're doing what's right in your own eyes? Is there some area of your life where you're claiming, yes, I'm a follower of Jesus, and yet you're following your own truth rather than his truth? God, speak to us. Show us, God. We, we want to know. Convict our hearts. Let us know. Lead us into the way of everlasting. And so the application, because I don't want us just to hear the word, but I want us to do the word. A pastor I love once said, never preach a message without asking, so what? So what? What do you do with this? This is the question for you to ask. What one decision could you make? What one action could you take that would change the trajectory of your life and your legacy? One decision. What one decision could you make? What one action could you take to leave Moab and return to Bethlehem? And if you need some help, that, that's our job here as the Bridge Church. We want to walk with you through that. Some of you, you could cut up your credit cards. That could change your life. Others, you, 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 could, you could be the first one to apologize. I'm sorry for what my part in 
what I did wrong. Some of you, you could break up with that person and move out. Don't settle for somebody who's worshiping a false god because you want someone who worships the king of kings. Some of you, you could block that person from your phone or you could block them from following, the, or you could block uh, from following someone that's bringing you down the wrong path. Some of you could confess your addiction and ask for help. Some of you could live on less and give away a lot more. One decision, one action. Some of you, you could surrender something to God. Others, you could surrender someone to God. And there are many of you that you just need to fall on your knees in broken repentance and surrender to Jesus, the King of kings and the Lord of lords. To get to the right place, you have to leave the wrong one. It's about the, the re. You say, what do you mean the re? The, the re, the repentance. Over a thousand or, or over 1,100 times in the Bible, the word shove is used. Shuv means to re, return. Over 1,100 times we see it. It's all about the re. It's all about the re. In fact, I have a little one sentence re message for you. This is how it goes. It's all about the re. When you rebuke the enemy and return to God by repenting of your sins and receiving Jesus, your spirit will be reborn, your mind will be renewed, your life will be rebuilt, you will be reconciled by the Christ redeeming work. And while you rejoice, you will reap the rewards of the relationship causing revival to break free in your life. Come on, that's what it's about. Leave where you've gone, leave where you've been and go to the place where he wants you to be at. One decision, one moment, one choice can change the trajectory of your life. And so will you do that? Will you listen for his voice? And will you respond to that challenge to leave Moab, to return to Bethlehem, to choose God's way rather than yours? Let me pray for us. Father, we pray to you right now that we would turn every part of our lives over to you. If we've never experienced your salvation, God, maybe somebody's watching this message right now, online right now, they've never given their life to you. God, I pray that today they would turn to you, that they would repent of their sins, confess their sins, and accept what you did for them on the cross. For those of us who've started that journey, God, give us the grace and the conviction to do one more thing that that takes us away from brokenness and sinfulness of, of this world and that leads us towards your righteousness, your kingdom, your will. So give us the courage, give us the power, give us the, the desire to follow your way rather than ours. We pray this all in Jesus' name, amen.